Good evening. We can all take our seats and we'll get started. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is a meeting to manage Spring City Council. It's a work session and it's for November the 9th, 2021. We'll start with the roll call. Councillor Shada. Here. Councillor Johnson. Here. Councillor Chandler. Present. Councillor Bremner. Here. Councillor Wolf. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Fortune. Present. And the mayor is also here. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, tonight is devoted largely to uh, hearing from our boards and commissions to see what their plans are for the coming year as we move into the last throes of budget season. So there is a, in the published agenda, the third item we have tonight is the Housing Advisory Board. I've uh, been informed to hearing a little bit ago that one of those, uh, one of the representatives for the Housing Advisory Board needs to leave uh, for a seven o'clock appointment. If there's no objections, I'd like to go ahead and start with them and then we'll go ahead and take the rest of the uh, organizations in order. Any objection? Okay, thank you. Not hearing any objections, we'll go ahead and start with the Housing Advisory Board. And we have nine groups tonight. Um, so if we could keep the presentations to about 10 minutes, that I think will, would uh, move things along nicely. Thank you. And if you'll go ahead and give us your name and title and addresses, please. All right, hi, Aliyah German. I'm the chair of the Housing Advisory Board, 109 Cave Avenue. Hi there, Allison Gerbig. I'm the vice chair of the Housing Advisory Board and I live at 314 Terrace Place. Well, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, council members for accommodating our schedule and hearing us today. And in terms of, oh great, so we'll just tell you advance the slides. Um, so just a little bit of history because we realized that some council members might not, not have it. The HAB was, I guess it's the second newest uh, city board and was founded in 27 as a, 2017 as a specific act action from the uh, Plan Manitou to establish a housing advisory board. Before that, for a couple of years, we had the Affordable Housing Task Force and a, a couple of the HAB members were, were a part of that. And that was kind of the first step in trying to catalog and understand the issues around housing and affordability in, in Manitou and then kind of bringing that to, to light to the city as, as this being an issue that needs to be addressed at a city level. So one of our, our first actions was to develop um, a strategic plan. And as that, actually the slide before, sorry. <laughs> I'll, mo I'll move quickly after this. You're moving it, thank you, Denise, okay. <laughs> I will, so this is our vision statement. Residents of all ages, abilities, and means have access to safe, affordable, and quality housing in a living neighborhood, livable neighborhood. Next slide. So I'm uh, Aaliyah German. I'm the chair of the Housing Advisory Board at the moment. And my background is I'm an engineer, works with an efficiency consulting company. And a lot of what I do and my passion is related to kind of efficiency and how it relates to the built environment and how that impacts livability of homes, both utility cost, comfort, uh, durability, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of my, my, my passion and, and what I try and bring to the, to the HAB. And we have Allison. Sure, and I'm Allison Gerbig and I'm a licensed social worker. I work at an agency here in Colorado Springs or in Colorado Springs um, called Rocky Mountain Human Services. We're funded by the VA for a program called Homes for All Veterans, so I, work a lot with housing opportunities. I'm on the board of the Pikes Peak Continuum of Care, so I have access to a lot of really good best practices and resources around housing um, throughout the nation. Thanks. And Andy Wells, he also, he's been a me member, as have I, since the founding of HAB. He's a multi-generational Manitoid and so has a lot of kind of living history of, of Manitou and its issues and, and as well as a property manager in town and so brings that perspective to the board. Regina DePadova has been a member since 2019 and she works with Cheyenne Village. She's the director of community services there and so she really brings her perspective of, kind of the issues related to the disadvantaged communities that, that Cheyenne, Cheyenne Village serves. And then Barb Bunn is our, our newest 
uh, board member and she joined this year. <laughs> and she's a social worker. She's actually on a call right now. She was planning on being here, but she's on a call for the Red Cross. And um, so she really brings kind of her understanding of social issues and her perspective serving, serving those uh, in, her, in her work to the board. Next slide. Thank you. So one of 2021 accomplishments, I think the biggest thing that we've done is develop a draft habitability and housing standards. And this took us most of 2021 to develop. We met with stakeholders, reviewed standards from other cities and went through various iterations of, of this document and look forward to having a discussion with you all on it probably early next year. I'm sure everyone saw the article in the Pikes Peak Bulletin last week that is really unfortunate and a great example of why we need to establish habitability standards, as well as a rental licensing program. And so we started looking at what, what that would look like for all rentals in, in Manitou Springs, and we'll continue kind of developing that, that, that vi vision working with, with staff and council. Um, we have worked with uh, the uh, Logan Simpson consultant on zoning code updates and giving our perspective. There's the energy efficiency upgrade program that was implemented in, let's see, in, 20, in 2020, we had a successful program working with a consultant brothers redevelopment where we provided incentives to, to people in Manitou to upgrade their home, to install insulation, to upgrade old equipment. And um, we've worked with them, them this year to kind of refine the criteria for that program and hopefully make it more, more successful in years to come. We uh, heard from a, a home sharing group and worked with them to kind of educate the community about that, that program and its availability in Manitou. Some professional development, a tour of the Colorado Springs Housing Authority projects and, and invited a number of expert speakers to our meetings and education through Pikes Peak Bulletin articles. Okay. So our, our challenges, as I mentioned, the energy efficiency program, it, it did stall out for this year and that was partly because of kind of a log lag from COVID issues where they took through Brothers Redevelopment, that is the consultant, there is money available both from City of Manitou Springs in 2020, as well as the El Paso County. And it took them through early 2021 to, to spend all that money from the county. And so there are some concerns about, it. by the time we were able to be in a place to be under contract with them, if there was enough time for them to identify and find enough participants. and. So hopefully, you know, it stalled for 2021, but we're hopeful that we are in a good place to get the ball rolling in, in January of next year if, if we have budget for that. Um, so, good. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> Solutions for attainable and affordable housing. I mean, we've, I think we've realized over our three, four years of existence as a board that there's only so much we can do. There's only so much the city can do. It's, it's really challenging to try to find effective ways to uh, identify solutions for, for Manitou. Ed education, you know, ensuring that we're communicating the needs of, of housing to the community effectively and finding ways to, to engage them. We'd like to work, work at doing that better next year. And turnover of city staff and as well as HAB board members has been a challenge. Next slide. So looking to next year, we are looking forward to discussing with council about habitability standards and, and hope that we can uh, adopt those next year. I know there's been some really good questions from council and we're talking about those with the board next, next meeting, next week actually. And so look forward to talking about all those, those items with you. We are looking to develop a draft rental licensing program and, and propose that to council. Reinstate the energy efficiency program with the, you know, I referenced the revised eligibility criteria and, and kind of looking forward to how, how this can be a successful program, what, what we want it to look like for the next you know, handful of years. 
and then looking to other other solutions and you know one of one of these on this list is accessory dwelling units and we 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 remain optimistic that that we can find some way that there is a a balance between how this can be really beneficial to to some homeowners that that could really benefit from the flexibility of having an ADU while balancing the 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 challenges and the concerns that that people have in Manitou continuing to develop and, and nurture the existing relationships we have with, with regional housing partners, such as the, the county and Brothers Redevelopment, developers, investors potentially, and take a look at the strategic plan and update that as, as necessary. All right, so that brings us to the budget request. We have a total of $18,000 and 10,000 is is for the energy efficiency program so that's that's the same amount that we had in the program for for 2020. 2000 for marketing education part of that is going to support marketing of the energy efficiency program and uh, other professional development act activities that may may came up, come up and six thousand dollars for consulting engineering research um, this you know may include coordinating with, with consultants who can help us, for example, kind of refine the uh, rental licensing program to make sure that we're addressing the needs that, that, that we know that we, we've seen in the city that, that exist and make sure that a program like that uh, addresses those effectively um, or, or other consulting services that are clearly kind of outside of the, the city's expertise and purview to, to help us identify partners or um, develop develop programs here internally. So that's that's what we have. Great, thank you. Um, we've we've got a pretty full agenda tonight, uh, but I guess I would like to give council the opportunity if you if we've got uh, a quick question or two. Julie, you mentioned about wanting six thousand dollars for consultants. Have you worked with the cons We already have consultants that I think are working on, um, as part of the planning code, looking at the licensing of rentals that you referred to. Are you working with those consultants or do you want your own consultant? So this, this would be a, an as needed budget item. Um, so in, we've had that in our budget the past couple of years as, as things have come up and there's been, there's been some recommendations that, that perhaps um, engaging with consultants that, are, that don't have, that are outside of the city's level of expertise. So, you know, we only have so much knowledge and understanding of affordable housing. And I think to the extent possible that we can work with the existing consultants, that's, that's great. And yes, we are working with them. If there are identified needs that are outside of that, that, that seem like, okay, this is you know, a really good, I think very focused, right? A very focused activity for a consultant that'll help us bring something to, to a successful finish line to be able to, to bring that expertise in. Thank you. And that just real quick, I think the key too is that we were not trying to just recreate the wheel. There's a lot of best practices that are already around the country, so we, you know, want to put that um, knowledge to our city as well, w you know, within the parameters of our great city. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Council? Natalie, or excuse me, uh, Judith. Thank you. Um, just a comment, really. Um, I just think it's great what you're doing. Um, in reading through the habitability standards that were presented to Council, um, which I thought were re was really interesting, my, my only recommendation is that all of the language and all the standards throughout the city be gender neutral. Mm -hmm. And I actually did count that you use he and his 16 times and she and her zero times. So I, I, the, the content is great. I just, um, I would just love to see that be a, a gender neutral document. And that's really my only comment. Thank you. Thank you for that. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All righty, um, then we'll get back on a regular schedule at the Planning Commission, Alan Delwich.
Well, good evening. I'm Alan Delwich. I live at 210 Vail Linda Vista. And um, I'll, I'll go pretty quickly here. The Planning Commission basically serves as an advisory board to the City Council, and we are, have uh, quasi judicial review of uh, land use items. And uh, our purpose could be phrased as guiding and accomplishing a coordinated, well adjusted, and harmonious development of the city and its environs. And um, we have a lot of experience on the Planning Commission. I think I added up, it's roughly 80 years of participation. You know, several members have been on the commission for a while and gone off and come back. It's kind of, you know, people like participating. So, um, so our activities are pretty much uh, listening um, looking at those land use items. And this last year has been fairly slow relative to other years. We've had a nine variance requests, three major conditional uses, a minor conditional use, six rezoning hearings, and one major development. And I, I would think just the, the last year has just been different for a lot of reasons. We've also participated in the ongoing maintenance of the ma master plan, and we're currently participating in the zoning code update. So our, our biggest challenges have been dealing with COVID. You know, it, it, uh, I think this last year, maybe th a third of our meetings were in person, maybe a little more, and the rest were Zoom, and it's not as effective to be, to try to have a good meeting with Zoom. So that anyway, hopefully that's gonna change in, in the coming year. And um, our goals are to continue doing what we're doing, part, you know, having nice count, uh, commission meetings and working on the zoning code update. Um, as far as uh, budget requests, you know, we, we don't have a lot of programs we participate in. The main thing is education. And I think that's a, an important thing really for all our boards and commissions to have this continuing education, refreshers on legal issues, open meetings and so on. So that's really probably the goal of what, what we're looking at. And I, you know, when I was thinking about this, I thought of one other item that could benefit all of our boards and commissions and council. Since we're now in this venue here, we've gotten rid of our, our uh, voting system and this hand raising thing sort of takes away from, you know, how it, we used to do it where, you know, everybody would vote, then we'd see the vote rather than, you know, people piecemealing, putting their hands up. So. I think that would be a really good investment. There are a lot of tools like that. I don't think they're that cost, costly and that could get us back to the more traditional way of voting. So happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Alan? Boy, Alan, you get credit for clear and concise. Right, I had to catch up, get you ahead of schedule. Okay, me, oh, we do have no. a question, Natalie. Okay. Well, it's, it's unrelated to this, but it looks like there's no audio on the um, video. Just so you know. So. Do you want to take a quick break to see if we can get it fixed? Judy's gone, so we're going to have to make some phone calls, or do you want to keep going? It's your call. I think we'll keep going. Okay. Unless I'll council has an objection. No objections, okay, I think we'll keep going. Okay. okay, Alan, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so next we have the Historic Preservation Commission. Yes, good evening, Ann Nichols, and I'm sitting in for Joy Porter, who is our chair, but couldn't be here tonight. So as soon as, <laughs> that's okay, Denise. <laughs> So I think you've obviously seen the 
the uh, P pre PowerPoint presentation, we talk about what we do. We're quasi-judicial like the Planning Commission, so we react to applications we get. Um, and as you can read for yourself, those are what we say are our kind of vision goals. And then moving on, the list of commissioners, maybe. <laughs> we are missing uh, a couple of regular members, but we have added Susan Presti just recently, which was a great addition. And so we're a fairly small board at the moment. Uh, Doug Edmondson, myself, and Pamela Wright, in addition to Joy Porter and Susan Presti. And we do have a couple of al alternate members. And we've listed our dates when we were actually appointed. So a number of us go back quite a ways. And then on to our accomplishments. The main thing we accomplished this year was the completion of the Historic District Survey Plan, which is a great document that really details the history of the Historic District, what dis sub-districts have been surveyed, what sub-districts really could benefit from some historic preservation specialists looking at the resources in the district and basically determining which are contributing and non-contributing. So that was a good start to where we're gonna go next year. We did deal with 16 material change of appearance applications. And because we're a certified local government under the historic preservation rubric, we have to do annual education and it lists some of the courses and seminars that we were able to participate in. And then moving on to challenges, sort of like Alan described, our basic challenge was that operating during COVID, we still are meeting totally uh, virtually. And we have for two years now not been able to hold our annual historic honor awards, which are a pretty big deal for the, our applicants who have been approved for changes to their historic dwellings and then get honored for that. So we hope to start that again this in 2022. And our main goal for 2022 is actually just to carry on with the implementation of the survey inventory plan. Uh, FHU, who was the consultant for that plan, prioritized what uh, sub-districts are the main ones that would benefit from being surveyed. And so our intent is to pursue grants so that we can accomplish one or two sub-districts next year. And then finally, I think we're into the budget. And we do every year budget $5,000 as a pass-through if some individual property owner in Manitou were to get a state historic fund grant, it would pass through us to them. And that hasn't happened, I don't think, for many, many years that I can recall. The support for the HPC is fairly significant, 93,500. And it includes 2,500 for the honor awards, training as the planning commission, as well as indicated is important, $750 for a a retreat, excuse me. And then we have for many years wanted to put historic district toppers on street signs so that people would know when they're in a historic subdistrict, because that, that is done on the north side in Colorado Springs and it's very effective. So we've budgeted 10,000 for that. The main amount we're budgeting is a match $50,000 for this historic survey plan that we hope to be able to do in 2022. And then as you're probably aware, both McLaughlin Lodge and Hiawatha Gardens are embarking on requests to, in the case of Hiawatha Gardens, add that building back into the historic district, in the case of McLaughlin Lodge to, Lodge, to shrink the historic district. And, the, and planning is has an RFP on the street to acquire a historic preservation specialist to aid in both of those efforts. 
and our mini grant program, which has been in place for a number of years, but has been fairly small, a $500 grant to help individuals with doing things like replacing windows, fixing historic walls. We've increased the amount of that to $10,000 for the total we would spend and have increased the grant amount from $500 to $2,000. The last statement that says with no match is not correct. No matter what the application is, there's a 25% match from the homeowner and we will apply, we will supply up to 2,000 in matching grant. And that is my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions. Council questions? Let's see, Mayor Pertem, please. Yeah, and this is something that I should have asked of Housing Board and Planning Commission as well, and that is, is there anything that the HPC needs from council and other, I, well, two questions. First of all, all these budgets that are being presented tonight are already included in the budget. Thank you. And so is there anything else that the HPC Housing Advisory Board and Planning Commission needs from council in terms of support or other than budget? No, I think we've been happy with the amount of increase that's in this 2022 budget. So no, we're, we're pleased with that. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Julie. Thanks. Can you explain a little more? Um, I understand the 78,750 and 50,000 of that is for the matching grant and the remaining, I guess, 28,750 is for, can you explain what that's for? It says modifications and surveys. Right, again, the 25,000 is an estimate of what it was gonna cost to acquire a consultant to help provide input and expertise in the two main measures that we're facing right now, which is a request from the McLaughlin Lodge developer to shrink that district and the request, the nomination from a resident of Manitou to put the Hiawatha Gardens dance hall, historic dance hall back in the historic district. And so that the RFP that the city has has issues is to acquire the expertise to help them think through and help the commission think through both of those uh, fairly unusual requests. I mean, we don't often see a request to shrink a historic district, nor do we often see a request to add in an area to the historic district. And can you help me understand what was it that the HPC decided it was good to spend money on to see if we can shrink the district for the McLaughlin Lodge? How is that a good thing? Well, again, because we have the whole time I've been on HPC, which is quite a few years, we have never had a request in front of us to shrink an existing subdistrict. And that's what the developer of, Hewath, of uh, McLaughlin Lodge has proposed. Well, why are we paying for the McLaughlin Lodge's developer to answer his question for him about, sh I, I still don't get how that's I, yeah, I think what planning something that is we should doing, spend money on. Right, and I understand the question. I think what planning has determined is that this is an unusual request that they don't internally have the expertise to perhaps provide the kind of background that the commission would need to make a good decision. So typically when that would happen in planning, it would be the developer would be required to pay money to their own expert to present their case to us. But why is the city paying so that McLaughlin Lodge can find out if it would be doable for them to shrink their history? How does that, is that beneficial to the city? I, I'm not, I don't, I think what's beneficial to the city is providing the expertise, who, regardless of who pays for it. And I honestly do not know why it's not passed along to the developer. But I think the, re, the reality is that neither planning nor the HPC has the background in this kind of request to probably do a good job without some help. Would it bother the HPC or would it bother you personally? 
is the HPC required the developer to get his own expert and present that information to you instead of us paying for it? It, it would not bother me personally, and I don't know what the, the actual protocol there is. But. Okay, I, I don't either. Thank you. Great, thank you. I would just ask, wouldn't that be kind of the fox watching the hen house sort of thing? I could see it as a pass-through that planning would charge it to them as part of a fee, but. Well, I mean, what we have done in the past when we have, for example, requests to demolish structures, and we have a fairly detailed code requirement on what has to be addressed, is if we think uh, that we need our own expert to look at what the developer or the homeowner or whoever is proposing the demolition has presented, I think we do require them to pay for it. So I guess I don't know the answer to that. I think it's fabulous that you would choose the expert just like we would choose our own engineer and planning on a major development, but the pat I don't think it should come out of the general reserves. Uh, okay, but I won't belabor it anymore. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? I guess thank not. You, thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for your time. The next uh, item is the uh, match board. Neil? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So we could advance. Um, so this is our current board. We have two members who joined us since mid-year, <laughs> Ralph Ruton and Kinsey Watts, uh, and we have openings for two alternates. Um, and the alternates on our board are very active, so we need alternates. Um, moving on to the budget, so the, uh, th the budget from a, a revenue standpoint is a direct calculation from the budget that's um, sales tax. So for 2021, the budget that we expect to have available for distribution um, early next year is 442,000. Um, but let's talk about the expenses here. Um, we've learned a lot this past year. Uh, we're on to our third grant round now. The window is open. Uh, we are doing a postcard mailing and we're also doing training. Uh, both of which are expense items. So for next year, we're assuming we have a mid-year round in addition to the, the round that's open now. So that would be two potential postcard mailings, um, two rounds of training for applicants. Uh, we observed that um, we had very few poor ideas but we had a number of uh, applications that could have been better than what was actually submitted to us. Um, staff time, um, we're trying to get Becca out of the um, business of, um, of providing s support or the amount of support that she does now. Um, so there is a four hours a week assumption here on staff time. And the fourth item, um, we have it in here, which is a grant optimized website, uh, really because if we don't put it in now, then we've got to come back potentially at mid-year. But we have uh, one of our board members actually has experience with this um, and has seen the efficiencies uh, from having more of a, a workflow approach to how um, a website can be automated to engage with applicants versus what we do today. Uh, we've still got a, a lot of work to do on that, but we're placing it in the budget. And of course, any unspent funds will go back into the pool that gets used for grants. You know, on the next page, I'll just talk a little bit about this, this grant op optimized website um, you know, it's, it's, 
um, how we accept applications, it's how we evaluate applications, it's the administration that's un, um, um, underlying that. Um, there's a lot of opportunities with automated emails. Um, as uh, you know, Denise knows, we had to ask her help to send emails out to everyone to remind them to send us you know, reports. So there's a f number of efficiencies, but we don't know yet if it makes sense. So that's probably the biggest open item from a budget standpoint. Um, so I'm gonna pause there, John. Okay, thank you, Neil. Uh, do we have questions or comments from council? Julie? Does this money come from the tax money or is this from the general revenue? Uh, it's, it's the 0.3% sales tax um, that was added. So Manitou Springs is a 9.03% sales no, tax. No, 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 Neil, uh, please don't give me that. I'm, I'm trying to, I didn't make myself clear. Go. The $8,320, is that coming from your tax money or yes. is that coming from the general fund? It's coming from the tax money. And the same with all the other numbers on here? Exactly. Thank yes. you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Guess not. Great. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Appreciate Thanks. it. And next, we're going to hear from the Transportation and Parking Board. Yeah, and, and Bill, you're going to have to get close to the mic, about three inches or so. Okay, is that better? Yes. Okay. Well, and would you need names and addresses, please, gentlemen? Yeah, uh, Bill Kerner, 205 Ruxton Avenue, and Carl Stang, 204 Crystal Park Road. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, mobility and parking. One of the uh, really big challenges our city has, and you all know it, is the fact that congestion is choking the life out of our uh, livability coefficient, if you want to call it that. And I think great strides are being made, but a lot more work does need to be accomplished to get to what I would call a stable situation that uh, we can all live together in relative harmony. <laughs> So um, we put together, and I, I haven't run this by the board yet, it was a last minute thing, a vision statement, and you can read it. It's to collaborate with city staff to research, evaluate, and make recommendations. Bill, Bill again, if you're close to the microphone, please. I'm sorry? Yes. I can't move my head. <laughs> um, and address mobility and micromobility, and micromobility is a new addition to our charge. It has been around for a while, but it's increasing in importance. And specifically, uh, micromobility addresses uh, bicycles, uh, possibly scooters, electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Carl is uh, gracious enough to come down tonight. He is, I would call it, great expert and advocate for micromobility. Um, the whole idea is to reduce uh, uh, the impact on the quality of life of residents, businesses, and visitors to Manitou Springs. Um, this is a draft, and I'm going to be taking it to our board meeting at our next meeting. Um, Mobility accomplishments and, and parking. Uh, obviously, uh, one uh, significant impact or accomplishment is that we are now the Mobility and Parking Board to incorporate mobility in our function. And that should not be taken lightly. That, that's a very important thing that we need to develop. And I think we're on our way now. We recruited 
uh, three um, what I would call mobility experts, <laughs> including Carl, to um, help us do this. And I think uh, we're, we're making some strides in this area. Um, we recommended the change to the ordinance and the emphasis on mobility. Um, and we established a micromobility subcommittee. Carl is on that subcommittee to address implementation ideas. Uh, one of the things that came out of this was the safety stop ordinance, which city council passed. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. And uh, we also support the Hiawatha Gardens Task Force 3 implementa implementation of the mobility hub, which is a key component. That's called out in the TMMP, and um, we're working on that as we speak. Uh, challenges. Uh, in any board, one of the challenges is working together as a team. Uh, we come from different viewpoints. We have different ideas and priorities. I think we're making great strides at accomplishing that. And it's a continuing effort to, uh, to have everybody pretty much on the same page. Um, we have some challenges. Uh, obviously, visitation. Um, after COVID's over, we can anticipate really getting slammed with more visitors. Um, and I don't use that in a derogatory form or word. It's really just a result of people liking Manitou Springs, wanting to come here and experience um, all the amenities and uh, that we can offer um, ecotourism, uh, runners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and the Cog Railroad is probably gonna be at full capacity. Um, COVID has uh, played a little bit of havoc with uh, our plans, um, staffing issues, uh, which I think are continuing to be resolved, and board membership, which is, uh, we have seven board members now, we're probably gonna lose one but uh, we have a history of um, really getting enough people to be interested in, in uh, transportation and parking as we were, were called before. But I think now that we have mobility, that's really adding a big plus factor to where this board can go. Goals for two, 2022, maintain a seven member board and try to recruit three alternates. Um, implement an onboarding process. One of our board members suggested that, gosh, he joined our board and he didn't know what we were doing. And so we need to provide a, uh, a, an education package, if you will, so people can get up to speed more quickly. I think that's really important and I'll get to uh, that in a minute. Um, advanced micromobility design and implementation at the hubs at Hiawatha and also the COG hub. Uh, we uh, were very pleased to hear that the city council is signing up to an enterprise fund. Um, we would hope that as needs develop, we can identify specific needs and functions and accomplishments uh, that we would anticipate having uh, money to make happen, and, uh, but that's down the road. Um, we uh, wanna make use of maximizing uh, use of street light, which is a expanded uh, uh, capability. And uh, Roy, you wanna comment on that a little bit? Yeah, so the, the street light is a uh, software, it's called street light data, and I, I think I've mentioned it to council before, but basically we're able to get data from vehicles and bikes and pedestrians walking and driving through town and be able to get where they're going um, and, and things like that. So it's more data for, for the parking board to help all of us and the mobility board to make decisions going forward. Yeah, we, we want to make data-driven decisions. We don't want to just sort of go outside and see what's going on and, and come to some 
snap decision. We really want the data, and, and I think this will be a good tool that will address that concern. Um, parking logics, you're seeing the signs now identifying each one of the parking lots and the parking spaces available, and I think that is a great move, and thank you, Roy, for implementing that. And also, um, I believe there's a, going to be a sign on both the east and west entrances to Manitou Springs, which is going to basically summarize where the parking is available. And that's, that's going to be a great feature. As you probably know, when you drive through other towns, and I just will pick on Breckenridge, they have a sign like that, and it's very useful. So uh, we're... Uh, we're going into the 21st and 22nd century, hopefully. Um, the other uh, goal is to address the use of electric modes of micromobility. Um, that can take a number of forms where, a, as you probably all know, their electric bikes are now a very popular tool I've seen uh, an interesting vehicle the other day, if you want to call it that, it was a skateboard with a big rubber tire in the center, and it's powered, and it really goes. <laughs> I don't know whether I want to try it or not, but uh, things, things are in an evolutionary stage, and the challenge here is what do we want to accept and what we don't want to accept, so we'll be bringing recommendations to you with, with regard to that. So with regard to the uh, budget request, we don't have a specific budget request at this point. I think uh, that we're gonna have to work out with staff and as needs uh, occur and come back to city council and make a request for a specific item with a specific cost for your consideration. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Council, questions? Councilor Chandler? Thank you. So um, in your vision statement, you talk about mobility in general, um, but you don't specifically address mass transit, our, our buses in town. And uh, I feel that that's a huge component of mobility here. And um, you do mention in your vision statement that, uh, you know, it, it's important to improve the quality of life for residents. And yes. um, I've made no secret of the fact that um, I'm disappointed in our mass transit system. I think it's antiquated. I believe that it um, serves um, visitors and tourists quite nicely, um, but doesn't do a whole lot to support residents. Um, and so I, I'm a couple things. I'd like to know, does the map, um, do you uh, have input when the Mountain Metro uh, schedule is, is due to be reviewed twice a year? Uh, and, and if not, why? And also, um, so we've got a budget line item for Mountain Metro, and does that, how, how does that or does that in any way impact the mobility and parking board? Well, yes, it, it does. Uh, and it's something that I think we need to get a better handle on, frankly. Uh, it's been somewhat out of our purview to address uh, the contract between Mountain Metro and, and Manitou Springs for uh, Route 33 and 3, um, specifically the uh, shuttle. And uh, we all, I think, are concerned, at least I certainly am, about how we do the shuttle and are there more efficient ways to do it? Can we increase the frequency of it? Do we need these great big vehicles that Mountain Metro only provides? A question mark. I don't have an answer on that for you. I think it's a concern that, that probably everybody on the board has that we need to figure out how to do um, bus travel, transport better and we haven't gotten to that point yet. I think we're pretty much tied to Mountain Metro, and until we come up with uh, uh, an, a good, cost-efficient, 
better alternative that better addresses the ridership uh, with a better schedule and so forth and so on, um, we're, we're sort of stuck with Mountain Metro. But hopefully we can make a change there. And one, this could be a possible funding source using the um, Enterprise Fund to address these concerns. I'd like to propose um, a subcommittee, possibly with one or two council members, to sit down and look at the current um, Mountain Metro uh, routes and how we can look at, A, making these routes um, more accessible and year-round, not just during tourist season, for example, for the 36 shuttle, but also, I mean, the, uh, m uh, mass transit affects climate change, it affects the environment, it affects pollution, it affects parking. So it's, you know, to not look, to not take a good look at that, um, I think, I, I, I think it's dismal. I mean, we have, c we have neighborhoods that aren't served at all. Um, Crystal Hills, for example, um, it's my understanding, I was looking at the number three uh, route, which is our only bus that takes residents from their homes to the grocery store and the pharmacy. And so that mm -hmm. bus, that number three bus stops at the hub. So if you're a single mom with a kid and you gotta go get your groceries and you live at Banana Manor, <laughs> um, you know, think about, I, I'm really trying to get in the weeds about how, how much we have really missed the mark on, on, on providing the type of mass transit that our residents need just for their basic needs and quality of life. So I'm just gonna throw that out there, a subcommittee to take a look at the current routes and perhaps take a look at um, really doing a 180 and, and, and make, making some big changes this, this year, if not this year, next year. Thank I you. can't speak for the whole board on this uh, specifically, but I share your concerns and I think you have a great idea. We, it's been a long time coming before uh, to now address the, uh, the whole uh, Mountain Metro way of doing business and we can't be locked into their decisions as to how they want to do the system. We've got to figure out a way to address the concerns that you've just voiced. And uh, if I may be so bold as to suggest, we'd like you to be a member of the subcommittee. Be happy to do so, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Nancy? Yeah, um, two things. One is, is there anything, and I keep forgetting to ask the, all the boards and commissions this, over here, Bill. <laughs> yeah, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking around. And um, um, is there anything that you need from council other than perhaps me a member or two for a subcommittee um, that you, you know, it, you, you, Bill, live through when things were not as great between the boards and commissions and council? I think it's improved dramatically. But is there anything that you currently could suggest that would make things um, uh, more productive for your board? One thing that uh, does strike me is we would like to have a council person come to our meetings. Natalie. We do not have that. Natalie attends. Okay. I apologize that I missed one. I got stuck in traffic in Denver, but oh, okay. I've made it to every other one since I was appointed. You, you did, okay. but, but, um, but that absolutely brings up is to, again, all of the boards and commissions out there who I've missed, you all should have a council liaison. And that is your, um, you know, communication from council to you guys and from you guys back to council. So take advantage of that. And uh, following up on what Councilor Chandler said, you know, in one of your 2022 goals, you talk about um, implementing the TMMP. And as you know, um, public transportation, public transit was the number one prioritized goal in there. So I, I think, you know, prioritizing that as a committee would not be a bad idea. It, it, I think it's a great idea. And uh, quite frankly, we really haven't had the charter to really get into that as a committee. And, um, and you've got the TMMP, so and it's in your goals. So I think you right. do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if we can consider that, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Then we will dive in. Is that what you were asking? Yes. Okay. Now I'm just one. Well, obviously, Councilor Chandler and I agree on this, but you know we're just two of council. Um, 
but I think you have some um, a, you know, ability to set your goals and objectives, and you've done that here. You said, you said that you want to work on the TMMP. So. Yeah, yes. And I think uh, staff support is critical in this area. And we would, uh, and we've gotten great staff support on all the issues uh, uh, thus far. And quite frankly, we haven't really do dove into the question of Mountain Metro and uh, transit that uh, council member brought up, so. Yeah, and think, think more broadly than just Mountain Metro. Public transportation is yes. not, not necessarily just Mountain Metro could be, but it doesn't have yeah, to be. Yeah, and forgive me, I, I use that as a uh, an example of uh, transportation, mass transportation. Other questions? Uh, Councilor Wolf, please. Yeah, picking up on the, the same topic, I'd really like to see the vision statement include uh, something about public transport or uh, tr public transportation. I also would really like to ensure that Denise is able to provide the map uh, as soon as possible with what the deadlines are for when we need to meet with uh, Mountain Metro because it, it's like almost a year in advance or six months in advance before you can get anything changed. So you really have to have advance notice. And then it, it seems to me also that the street light software that Roy was talking about with all this data, that would be essential to uh, incorporate uh, on the public transportation issue when uh, prior to meeting with Mountain Metro so that there's a strategy on how to maximize the use of our Mountain Metro dollars. I just wanted to throw that in there. And I, I think, um, I mean, I really like your ideas about trying to look at other public transportation besides Mountain Metro, but I just wanted to make sure that you folks are informed about that well in advance and, and if the data is available from the software program uh, to aid or to guide us in that respect, that would be great to have. Sounds like an agenda item for our next meeting, if that's in the cards, but we can make it in the cards. I'm sorry? I'm sure you have to vote on any vision statement revision, but. I guess I would just throw that out as a suggestion that it really well, I, should be I, right in there in the vision statement about public transportation. Well, I'll add it in the draft and we can take it to the board and uh, address that uh, as a board and come back with uh, a better finished uh, vision statement for you, for your consideration actually. Because we're, we're looking for ideas and inputs from everybody, so. Further questions? Yes. Um, just pointing out that in our packet at the very end, um, in all those wonderful questions we asked the city administrator, I did ask this question already in anticipation of tonight about um, with regards to Mountain Metro, when are the public comment dates on the bus routes in 2022? So in December, Mountain Metro releases its proposal for the spring service change. The public process is in January and implementation, implementation is the last Sunday in April. Then they have a June release of the proposal for the fall service change. The public process is in July with implementation the last Sunday of September. So the problem is if you miss it, <laughs> if you miss that comment period, then you're going to wait till the next six month comment period. And if you don't miss it, if you can get in there, they still don't implement those changes for six months, just FYI. So um, it is in the packet, that information. So we, um, I don't know if we missed this round or um, if, if um, like maybe Roy can address Mr. That. Cheney, could you address that please? Yeah, I met with Mountain Metro today. Um, Brian would need information in November to uh, ha have time to prepare for December. And so unless it's a major change that we're gonna do, there was no plans to have the uh, public uh, comment in January for this go around. Um, and that's been typical with Mountain Metro in the past where they don't change it every year. They don't do that every year. It depends on the, the nature of the change and how impactful it is. So, um, so he would need something really soon if we were to make a major change for 
the next go around. And then of course we can look at the May submission, so for fall. Um, but keep in mind that Route 36 w couldn't be implemented until the next year because they couldn't, they wouldn't make that change for that second round because this, the, it is for next year and it stops in the fall. So it would actually be for the following year, if that makes sense. Denise? So yeah, Roy and I just talked because he did meet with them today. We could put this on your agenda for next week if everybody wanted it on the agenda and have Mountain Metro here because that's the time frame. So we can go ahead if you guys vote. I can't do that. It's a regular session, so I need to know whether you want that right. on the agenda. Would, would council favor addressing this next week? I, I do not. I think it's just too fast. I think we need a strategy and, you know, some, yeah, a strategy basically of what we want changed because if we just mm -hmm. make a quick change or try to make a quick change, mm -hmm. the reverberations are pretty significant. I would mm -hmm. rather that council as a whole kind of tell TMM or direct TMMP or direct the MAP, this board, to take this on as one of their priorities so that by May we've got something of a strategy addressing uh, public transportation for Manitou. Mm -hmm. Councilor, Councilor Chandler? I, I'm in complete agreement with that. It's too soon. Uh, what, uh, in, in, in my perfect world, I would love to see a subcommittee or whatever you know it, the, the, the map wants it to look like, get together, um, have some meetings, uh, take a look at the current schedule, think about some, some really brainstorm about some creative ideas, look at alternates to Mountain Met Metro, and then present in spring. But it would be, it's my understanding that, that um, we'd have to have this on the agenda in April then for May. So just thinking of that timeline, that's what I would recommend. Okay. Natalie? Um, I agree with everything that's been said for the most part. I'm not convinced we need a subcommittee. I'm, I wanna kind of take staff and the map board for a ride first. I mean, we have people actively working on these issues now and creating a third committee feels a little redundant. But I want, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Okay. Mr. Cheney? Yeah, just a great idea, Ms. Wolf, about the uh, street light and using that data. Keep in mind, we just got the program, so we are working it out now and we're, we're getting d data and, and trying some things out. We also have to ask the great questions to the system, right? It's only a program. So what we do need to figure out are what are the questions we're trying to answer to get the data out. Um, and that's gonna uh, require us a lot of discussion with the, the board and, and what are we trying to do so we can find the, the, the right information to move forward on this. But so a little more time to that spring would be better for sure. Okay, Councilor Wolf. I'd like to see this uh, on a work session in March then because then Roy can get his data to us. We can talk about what, if, if I don't know that any help is needed, but if you need help in determining what the questions should be to help guide us toward uh, reasonable public transportation decisions uh, because I don't like when these things come up. Last year, I think it was at a council meeting and we were told it's too late to do anything. Uh, we'd have to wait six months. So I don't like that to keep happening. So I wanna make sure it's on our agenda in March so we don't have some last minute, oh well, kick the can down the road again problem. And hopefully by then you'll have that cool data. Okay, great. Uh, Councilor Chandler. And also, um, although I don't think we should really depend too much on these numbers, where the ridership numbers would be good to have, but my personal opinion is our, our bus route system is broken and I think that the, the, you know, if we look at ridership numbers and say, wow, there was really low, they're really low, I think part of that is because we, we need to take a look at the route. I'm gonna still put another plug in for the subcommittee and I'll say uh, the only reason, I mean, it's your decision to make, but um, sometimes when you get new, some people in the room that have been thinking about this for a long time, you've got a lot on your agenda. So any, any help that you need, I, I, you know, I, I want this council you know, we, to know that the council's here for you if, if that's what you decide, the direction you, you decide to go in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Council, any further comments? It, it seems that the, uh, there's, there's uh, good traction to, to address this in detail in, in March. That would give everybody a little time to work on this. So I think that would be uh, the direction council would uh, extend to staff if that seems agreeable. And also to the 
to the board, to the transportation board. Yes, I believe it would be agreeable. Great. Yes. Great. Super. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Bill. Appreciate it, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have the Open Space Advisory Committee. Uh, hey guys, um, thank you for doing what you do. My name is Shannon Solomon and I'm at 600 Crystal Hills, Crystal Hills Boulevard. Did you guys get the thank you part? <laughs> yes, we did, thank you. <laughs> Um, the first slide, I think, is our vision statement, right? I don't know that that's official, but our mission is to plan, purchase, and maintain open space and trails. Um, the taxpayers asked us to do that. I think it was in 99, and that's what we've been doing. That's the board. For the first time in a long time, I think we're full. We might have an alternate position, but I'm not sure. One alternate. These are our accomplishments. Um, I'm sure you guys have all read them. We installed a bunch of signs at almost every trailhead. Um, that took three years to figure that out. Um, the intimate stairs to just to the west of Pawnee, we rerouted that. The stairs, you guys all know, have been in trouble for probably 20 years. We rerouted that and then reclaimed the area. Um, we have surveys on the Black Canyon and Wildcat Gulch for the easements that are done. That's going to help us in the long-term planning. We cl closed some rogue bike trails at Wildcat Gulch. We installed multiple erosion control structures on the West Inman. Um, I don't know if you guys have hiked that, seen that. And we replaced some of the stairs, steps on uh, East Inman Trail um, coming up to Crystal Park Road. We've had the uh, Mile High Youth Corps here, I think this is the third year in the row, second year. Um, they gave us three weeks of work at about 25 grand. Um, so free work, I think we spent maybe 900 bucks for them. And we're ongoing, we have members that go to the Creek Walk Trail Committee, because um, that's kind of a, it's not really open space, but it's important to us as community members. Our big things, we just had a retreat trying to figure out what we want to do for 2021. We need to figure out our standard operating procedures. That's just basic business as usual, how we're going to do it. We have um, been tasked to catalog every single little bitty open space parcel. Um, and we haven't done that. And we're behind the times. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, tracking property and easements, current and wishes, that's kind of an ongoing thing. We're always looking for property. Um, trail maintenance, we're going to put together a program for system, or a program or a system for tracking the needs, the grants, the contracts, and who's doing the work. The Black Canyon open space, that's ongoing. We have, um, we have to finish some stuff for Palmer Land Trust before we can do anything. And the main thing that's holding us up is uh, archaeological survey. And that kind of got put on hold because of COVID. We are going to integrate and orient the new Parks and Rec Department. I think that's Skyler and um, right there. We're not even sure what we're going to do with them or what we can do with them. Um, and then we're always trying to figure out how to avoid user conflicts. Um, is that? Oh, our goals, just like I said in the last, our challenges, these are our main goals we have. And I'm going to put on top there, we didn't write it in, but our number one goal is to always um, procure property, turn private land into public land. Um, we want to, in 2022, complete the SOPs, the management plan for the discrete parcels like I talked about. So basically, this is everything I just said. Um, we're reestablishing a land acquisition subcommittee. What we do on that committee is just look at properties, find out if there's tax problems, find if there's a way for us to swoop in and get that piece of property. Um, and we always talk about going to the state open space conference, but we haven't done it. So that's still a goal. And this is our money. Um, we're not asking for anything from you guys, but we wanted to tell you how we plan to spend our money. Um, our money, um, the city's money. 
And um, I don't, do you guys need me to go through each one of those line items or do you want to just ask questions? I think it'd be sufficient to ask questions. Okay. So if, if it's okay, uh, Shannon, is there anything else you wanted to say before we get into the question mode? I don't think so. Okay, great. In that case, uh, council, if you have questions. Natalie? Is the grant match for a specific grant or is it just um, in the event that a grant becomes available? Um, well, so we have a Mile How Youth Corps grant that's out. Um, we don't know if we'll need a match or not for that. One of the main reasons we put all that money in because we think something might come up for Creek Walk. Um, so we wanted to have that earmarked. So if you guys come to us. Councilor Chandler. So um, just to make sure that debt service of $30,000, isn't that the final payment? And then that will go away either at the end of this year or early next year. Is that correct? We have that's that's one. Iron Mountain. And yeah. we'll be done with that in uh, June of 2022. Okay, thank you. Free and clear. Super. Okay, good. Anything else, anyone? I guess not. Perfect. Shannon, thank you very much. Nancy, do you have a question for us? What? I do not, but thank you for all the work you guys do. Okay. Thank you, guys. Oh, great. Thanks. Okay. Next, Park and Rec. Parab. Good evening. Danu Fat. 1201 Manitou Avenue. I'm the chair of the Parab Park and Rec Advisory Board. Uh, we too, this is the first time I've ever had a full board, <clears throat> so I'm really excited. Uh, we have three new members, and so we're trying to bring them up to date with, with what we're doing, and uh, we just recently updated our website to try to capture all the policies and um, different uh, um, resolutions that Parab has accomplished. So in 2021, one of our huge, big accomplishments was the completion of the west end of Soda Springs Park. And we also have uh, completed the design and construction of our Wheeler Pocket Park, which is a labyrinth. And we continue to add public art. We just installed the Mama Bear sculpture and we purchased and planted new trees uh, in our parks, and we are um, exploring other recreational amenities. Uh, the climbing rocks are a huge uh, recreational amenity that we added for Soda Springs. And we also have a new park and rec director, Skylar Beck. <laughs> We're figuring out what to do with him, too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for. Uh, one of our 2021 challenges, defining what projects are appropriate for our parks based on our desire to maintain and keep all of our green space, limiting concrete and parks. And that was really apparent with the Keith Herring Fitness Court. That, that was a tough one. That was, that was a real challenge. Um, also, um, trying to keep everyone happy. That's a constant. And then prior, prioritizing projects based on community need and desires. For 2022, our main focus is to start developing a master plan for Higginbotham Flats. And um, we'd like to start exploring more recreational opportunities for different ages, um, do our regular maintenance of our parks and recreational amenities, and take care of our urban forestry, and also support plans and initiatives from the Park and Rec Department to enhance parks and recreation. For uh, our pair of 2022, 22 budget request. It's from, uh, this is the Conservation Trust Fund, which is totally funded by the GOCO funds, the lottery funds. Um, this budget is based on our, 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 uh, our uh, post goals, the, the parks and open space trails goals, uh, para priorities, and, and, uh, and our identified projects. Does anyone have any questions on this one, this, this particular budget? Mayor Bertim? Yeah, um, not just on the budget, but um, I 
believe that you guys were tasked to look at a park usage policy, and I know you've done a lot of work on it, so I was surprised not to see it on your 2022 goals. Uh, well, actually, that uh, Skyler's going to be presenting that, I believe, in January. Okay. And so, so it's underway. It's well underway, and I just wanted acknowledgement because that's, yes. that's pretty important. Yeah. In fact, I think Skyler and Megan and Megan Weiss and uh, Jenna Gallus just recently met to kind of go over the draft and kind of refine it and further uh, clarify it. And also, um, if you know, included in our packet was the Soda Springs Park design, and um, you guys. It wasn't just phase one that you accomplished in 2021. You got a lot of phase three actually accomplished as well because you put in all the turf. That's correct. And trees um, out of phase that wasn't planned until phase three. So that was a sig I mean, it was well above and beyond what was in phase one. So. Right. Yeah. W once we started that project, we we decided to try to to uh, get as much done as we could while we were there working on on that phase and to include the, the uh, third phase also, which is the turf. So a lot of that additional um, work came from our Conservation Trust Fund budget to supplement the, the GOCO grant that funded the, the uh, phase one. And um, in, in terms of Soda Springs Park, Skyler and uh, the Para Board discussed moving forward uh, with Soda Springs and we all kind of came to the agreement that we'd like to kind of step back from that park and just let the public use it and and see if there's any f input or any more desires that they would like to see happen to the park. And then um, maybe a couple of years down the road, revisit the looking at the master plan again and, and seeing if that uh, phase two design is still uh, desired or needed or necessary. Okay, great. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Councilor Wolf? Just briefly, I for, what is phase two of design? Do you um, know what it is? Yeah, phase two is, uh, well, it's hard for me to remember all of the exact details, but it, it involves a water feature like when you're coming across the, the pedestrian bridge, there's a, a, a water feature there, and then it basically it's just another um, maybe defined uh, Crusher Fines trail that meanders through the, uh, the, the social area where people sit, where the rocks are for concerts and things like that, where they put their lawn chairs. Thank you. Councilor Chandler? Just FYI, under budget discussion in the packet, there is a schematic, there's a map of the three phases. Um, so I was just reading this article recently and I'm happy to share it with you and Skylar Beck coming from Boulder, you may be well versed in this, but it was really fascinating. It was talking about um, um, how most of our parks really don't offer a whole lot for visually and physically um, challenged individuals. And also this article addressed um, certain conditions such as autism. And it was talking about consultants that come in and will look at parks and, and um, g give you, um, you know, um, a, a, a grade, if you will, and, and give um, suggestions on how to make the park space uh, uh, more user friendly to our individuals who have certain challenges. So I wasn't sure if that's something that you've talked about before um, or if it's been implemented in Boulder, I wouldn't be surprised, but if you're interested in that, I'll just pass it on to you because it was just really fascinating. I had, it really, I learned a lot from it. It opened my eyes to how our parks just really don't offer a lot to, to especially um, wheelchair folks and, and, and visually impaired folks. Mm -hmm. Um, Parap has added a couple of um, handicapped swings. One is in, at Bill Bowers that was specially requested by a resident who lives up there who has a uh, physically challenged child. And we uh, installed one at Memorial Park also. So we, we do have a couple of handicapped swings, but. And your picnic tables were intended for um, wheelchair access as well. That's, that's correct. Thank you, Nancy. Anything else? 
Okay. I guess not. Thanks, Danu. Well, I have some more slides. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Please. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's okay. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, um, the other slide, uh, should be the, uh, the, uh, park and rec assigned fund that's in the general fund. It's the fees in lieu of land. Um, I'll just talk about it real quick. Basically, this, this funds, uh, is, is from when there's a subdevelopment that occurs. Um, we can choose either to get park land or we get fees in lieu of land. And... These funds basically cover the projects that the Conservation Trust Fund doesn't cover. So in this fund, we have uh, mini grants, which we provide to businesses and individuals that operate in Manitou. Our, our training strategic, strategic planning workshops, which, which is like the, the retreat. And we have money in that for in case people who might wanna do grant writing or something. Uh, could possibly go and, and, and learn how to do that. And then uh, just basic park improvements, such as renting dumpsters that uh, uh, aren't covered by the Conservation Trust Fund to help clean up our parks. So that's uh, $3,000, $4,000 in that fund that we have earmarked for 2022. And, uh, and, and another uh, project that isn't included uh, in the presentation tonight is in 2022, we are going to resurface the tennis court and create three new pickleball courts from funds from the El Paso Becker's Maintenance Fund, and uh, that'll, that'll be in 2022 also. Good. Thank you. Any, any questions? Anything else? I guess not. Thank okay. you very much. Great. Thank you. Great. We've got uh, two more um, Boards to hear from. Uh, I was thinking we've been at this about an hour and a half. Uh, if council has no objections, I'd suggest a short break and then we'll come back and finish this off. Okay. So why don't we come back at 25 of 8?
Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Can we go ahead and take our seats and we'll get started? Thank you. Okay, and next on the list is the Manatee Springs Chamber of Commerce. Mayor? Yes. I, I think we got the audio fixed, so if any of you have somebody that was trying to get in, if you could just text them or email them to let them know we think the audio is fixed. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, our vision statement is actually new, and that is to be the heart of a strong, sustainable local economy through business leadership. The mission statement has been there for a long time, and that is 
um, working with all of the elements of Manitou, the community, the residents, the businesses, the membership that we have in this city by providing services to promote the economy and protect the environment. Our board of directors, currently um, we actually have one vacancy on the board, but of the eight members, um, five of them are in retail, one restaurant, one lodging, and then one attraction member. There is a wealth of experience and um, and then, uh, as I said, it, it does represent all of the different sectors that make up the Manitou Springs business community. Um, Annie Schmidt was actually appointed as the community representative um, years ago as well. On our accomplishments, and you have the whole list, um, I think some of the, the major accomplishments are the improved communications with the business community related to everything from um, grant opportunities to changing mandates, um, facilitating communications within the business sector, um, and assisting the membership in navigating the economic crisis. Um, some of the others um, are our web presence, our online marketing is really where we saw an increase this year. And we believe that a lot of that was due to the pent up demand of not having travel in 2020 um, and still limited travel outside of the country. So more people were traveling in state this year. It was nice to see lodging properties actually thrive this year for the first time in a long time. Um, we worked with historic preservation to create a walking tour brochure that includes the historic structures, greenstone bridges and stairways. Um, and then we continued to, to build our relationship and partnership with the creative district um, through staff supportive programs um, such as Manatee Maid, Skeleton Craze, Pollination Stations, and we also have collaborated a whole lot more in the last um, year with city staff on a lot of different projects. And then um, the creative district, which kind of falls under the chamber umbrella, um, under the new director, B Becca Sickbert, um, shifted from prioritizing the COVID response programs to other economic development projects with the two areas of focus being sustainability and livability for Manitou Springs. Primary projects included streetscape and mobility improvements, um, such as bringing Pike right into town. In the pilot program, there are three locations available. Um, two of those have been set. The third is yet to come this year. And then it'll include more stations for next year. Um, as well as the pollination station program, which Becca was able to get the donation from downtown Denver for the planters, um, teamed up volunteers to plant them, to take care of them. And then in the downtown area, it's been the bid district that's been taking care of those. And then the turtle crossing out here at El Paso, which was a private partnership um, with the asphalt art, art installation. And then of course, another one was the financial prudence to reduce expenses and prioritize or delay maintenance um, issues that were not critical and purchases that could be, could be put off. Challenges, of course, COVID-19 continues to be a challenge. Um, it's always interesting to try and figure out what we can do, what we can't do as far as bringing people together. So we've done some smaller, um, more intimate events, um, but, and that will, I'm sure, continue um, in the future. We lost uh, a significant number of volunteers in the Visitor Information Center. Um, I think we've now had seven come back. 
but we originally had 14. So staff time is much more staff is spent on the counter with our visitors and with residents that come in. Um, the other challenges, of course, that deferred maintenance, not critical, um, and navigating the, the mandates and communicating those with the businesses and trying to, trying to keep everybody happy and safe. Leslie, the one thing you didn't mention was staff being scouted. Do you want to oh. just mention that? Yeah, our staffing, our staff has been scouted for other organizations, both both locally, um, and just heard about another one that an offer was sent today to to Jenna Gallus, um, that starting salary of more than twice what we're paying her. So uh, we keep trying to keep our staff intact. We have um, four full-time people, and then we have three that really share the weekend and holiday shifts um, that, are, that are very part-time. And we are open seven days a week, with the exception of Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day year-round. So it takes a lot of staff time to run that visitor center. Um, goals for next year. Um, some, of the, some of the priority goals, first and foremost, is always to be the voice when people are looking at Manitou. We don't want them to go to Colorado Springs to find out about it. We want, it, want them to come to us. Um, and then maintain a thriving business community um, for the betterment of Manitou Springs to work unilaterally with the city to improve sustainability, um, not only on, and reduce impacts of the, the events on neighborhoods, but sustainability all the way around. Um, so one of the things that's not on here that we will be working on is the plastic issue. Um, the implementation at the state level um, kind of begins in 2023, um, but really kicks in 2024. We will work with the business community through 2022 to have a plan that can actually launch by January 1st, 2022, or 2023. Um, some of the other goals uh, we were talking about, the um, some of the other goals that actually aren't on this list um, that we were talking about today, one of the things that we talked about is the 36 shuttle. And unfortunately, we really feel like the piece that's been put out by Mountain Metro, it doesn't tell anybody anything. So the chamber staff actually has a map that was created that's actually on the shuttle that shows where the different stops are. So we wanna create a whole brochure working with the city um, to put that together that we can hand out to the lodging properties so that they can encourage their guests to use the shuttle system, as well as adding a pike ride station at the chamber. So we will um, have all of the alternative uh, transportation sources and the creek walk. So it'll be the walk, ride, or take the shuttle, but leave your car here, stay in Manitou, plan your vacation, know before you go, uh, come in, here's how you get to these places. Um, we also want to work with the city with the streetlight data to actually be able to better target market um, to the visitors and more and more visitors to Colorado were really looking at those sustainable places, the places that do value um, protecting the environment. Um, another goal that we have is to work with, there's a program care for Colorado, Leave No Trace. We've actually had their principles in our visitor's guide for the last two years. We continue to promote that, but we also would like to uh, approach um, OSAC about maybe getting some of that signage up at the trailheads. 
Um, I think that kind of, and then, then the other thing um, that we would really like to do is create a resident sentiment survey to, to get some additional information on how the residents feel about business, what businesses should we be looking at as we have vacancies in town that maybe we could try and target and that they would support? Um, and then the adding an electric vehicle charging station is one of the other goals for 2022 that we're working with the city on. So there's a lot of partnerships between the city as well as the creative district to keep moving forward in a responsible tourism manner. And then the last slide is the 2022 budget. And um, well, actually there's two more slides because our budget goes much more extensive. Um, so our request from the city, um, which is the, the number that comes from the formula is $420,935. And our total revenue budget for the year actually is $672,035. So a lot of the additional funds we raise through membership, we raise through advertising in the visitor's guide, um, and we raise through our events. Okay, thank you. Did, did you wanna put the uh, those slides up on the budget amounts? Um, you have it, if you have questions about it, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, all right, thank you. Council, questions? Um, Julie? Yeah, I, the last slide I have doesn't have anything about budget numbers, so forgive me if I'm asking you something that you think I should know, but you said $420,000, but $672,035. Can you tell me what those two different numbers are? Could, maybe we could bring those slides up, or at least you can't. Oh, okay. I thought they were in They're the packet in the that packet. I looked at today. Sorry. What's the 420 number? Oh, okay. So the 420,935 is the money that we get through city funding, the actual revenue that we bring in and that we expense to is the 600 and... How did you establish the revenue that you brought in? Uh, you using... That number. Uh, we know from prior years that we can bring in about um, $100,000 in event revenue. Um, that we bring in about $50,000 in dues revenue, um, $37,000 in visitor's guide advertising. And so um, those, and then some miscellaneous funds such as the bid labor because we pay the bid employee and then we bill that back to the bid. So that adds up to $672,000? Yes, ma'am. With the 420 from the city. I see. Do you know what page in our budget book that is? I, I couldn't find it anywhere in the table of contents. I couldn't figure it out. But do you know? Oh, it's, well, it's, it's in the packet. It's in the packet, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I don't see it. I must be missing something. I don't want to hold you up. Uh, but thank you for explaining that. And if anyone knows what page it is in the budget book, that'd be nice to know. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bremner? Yeah, you mentioned Leave No Trace. I'd just like to point out that uh, the Incline Friends and Friends of the Peak, my organization, have been working on that, and we collaborate on uh, Leave No Trace with the bar trailhead as, as well as the incline. And uh, Friends of the Peak has two certified Leave No Trace members on our board, and we'd be happy to collaborate. Uh, of course, Friends of the Peak, our purview is mostly the Pikes Peak Massive, so that wouldn't include a lot of the trails for Manitou Springs. And incline Friends, of course, is mainly concentrated on the, on the incline. But uh, just collaboration is good. 
Great. Thank you. I will reach out to find out who they are so we can work with them. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Chandler. This is why I love this town. Uh, you mentioned the plastics ban. As we all know, by July 2023, it will be law. Um, I bring this up just because um, the Climate Action Work Group met last Friday and we decided to um, focus on one issue and we decided that that's going to be the plastics ban. And we had a three hour meeting um, and it was re it, it, to put together a proposal to bring to the chamber with some ideas on how Manitou can market itself as the first town to embrace it and actually make it happen. And um, with great ideas that even involved the creative district and some artists and so anyway, I just want to let you know that, that, that that's, the, that's one of the things that we identified. And so we'll be bringing you a proposal soon with some ideas and some creative ways to, to, um, to, to implement it quick, more quickly than, than the mandate. Um, so anyway, we're uh, just excited to, to be bringing that to you just for, for your um, input and consideration and um, th so that we can support you in that effort. Great. Thank you. Denise? Sorry. Um, yeah, a couple of things. It's on the budget book, page 105. It talks about how much we give to the chamber. It doesn't have their detail. Their detail was in the um, packet that you received. Yes, so I'm so sorry. I finally found the, the place in the packet where okay. it's at. Okay, great. But page 105 is 105, where 105, it shows how much we give, t We um, the city does provide to the chamber based on the formula. So it's a formula driven. And then they have their board that works with their budget accordingly and for their fundraising and, and their expenses, which is detailed in our packet. And do you know on there if the 10,000 holiday money uh, for holiday entertainment, it's no, holiday one. decorations, is that in addition to the, was it 30,000 that you had somewhere in the budget book for the Christmas lights? Yeah, it's 30,000 and that's a different line item. So that's a different one. Than so that. what's the 10,000 on here for? That's additional to they, pay for the lighting. Yeah, they pay um, 10,000. So the total cost of the Christmas lights is 40 grand, not 30? You guys manage that. The contract. first year the the first year that we did it actually it was we paid 60,000 for downtown and then there's another 30,000 for the URA. It's expensive for the holiday lighting. The first year lighting. you did it. Well, how about for 2022? Are we spending $60,000 on Christmas lights this year? or Because we'll apparently be it's different parts of the budget. I see 10,000 of it is here. Do we have 50 grand also from between URA and general fund? We're, we're doing 30 It'll for the holiday lights and then 20, I believe, for the celebration, for the 150 year celebration. So we're spending 30 plus 10? Correct. So it's 40 grand for the lights? Julie, I don't know the exact top, uh, because the URA also contributes. Can you provide details on that, Leslie? I don't have the exact amount. It's 30, the URA will have 30,000 as well for that area, for the URA area. So we spend 70,000 on Christmas lights? Yes. 70. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a loss. I was thinking there's 10,000 for Christmas lights coming from the chamber and 30 for the URA, so we've got 40 there. And then there's an, an additional 30 for downtown. Okay, right, thank you. Any other questions, council, or the chamber? If not, well, thank you, ladies. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. And the... The last uh, alphabetically and for the evening is uh, the URA. Turn it on, okay.
Uh, so I, I'm Jim Reeves. I'm the executive director of the Natchez Springs Urban Renewal Authority. And of course, Farley, you all know, who is the chair of the board. Uh, and Ann sitting in the back who wouldn't come up here is our treasurer. Uh, so uh, we're well represented tonight. And we actually had Alan here earlier, uh, Alan Delich, but he had to leave. So anyway, got quite a bit of uh, members on the board. So uh, starting off with our mission statement here, and you, I'm sure you've all read this, but uh, I just wanted to kind of give a little bit more detail than what's, what's up there. Uh, basically, we, are, are, we do our work twofold. Uh, one is we, everything is funded through tax increment financing, so it's not general fund uh, money. It's money that's actually generated by the taxes in the urban renewal area, generated by the new projects. Uh, so, uh, and so what we do basically is we use those funds to try to attract private development uh, and the tax increments that are generated by that private development are then invested in the, the project to offset some very unusual costs. Basically, we look at that as uh, making the playing field even so that a project in a redevelopment area, which is, tends to be more expensive, is as attractive as a greenfield development would be outside the area. So that's how tax increment financing would work to attract projects to the area. And we make sure that all the improvements they do are eligible uh, expenditures, infrastructure, if you will. Uh, and then the other element we use the funds for are actually public improvements. Uh, and uh, we you know, invest in things like the, the, the West Avenue project. Uh, we put some of our funds in there to make that happen. Uh, Becker's Lane and Becker's Bridge this year. Um, uh, we're gonna put some funding into Fields Park, as you saw probably in our budget. And, um, and we're gonna do other streetscape improvements. So kind of a balance of public infrastructure work and yet trying to put money into private development to try to encourage new development in the area. Okay, so 2021 uh, accomplishments. Uh, Spirit of Manitou uh, is a five-year project uh, working with the Arts Council to add five pieces, really monumental type pieces, to the corridor. And so far, we've put in two. Uh, the Eagle sculpture at the Pocket Park, and also the one that's actually called the Spirit of Manitou uh, by the Econa Lodge by Lulu's. Uh, so those are two of the projects so far. This year, uh, we didn't really get one in place. The Arts Council had some trouble trying to locate a, lo a, a location in the corridor. Um, however, next year, we're going to put two in. So we're going to make up for lost time. Um, and one will be actually at the uh, Holiday Inn Express site. That was part of the condition of our agreement with them is that they would provide us a location for an art piece. Um, Becker's Lane, I hope everybody's been out there. I think it looks great. Uh, we replaced the bridge. Uh, the project started off as just a bridge replacement and it, it morphed into the entire road all the way from El Paso to Manitou Avenue. Um, but most of that was required because of the uh, changes caused by the bridge. The bridge is wider uh, and the alignment uh, with the road wasn't exactly gonna work with the road the way it was designed. So we had to realign the road to make it fit better. Uh, but I think the net results are great. We have a, a whole new streetscape all the way from Manitou Avenue all the way to El Paso. So uh, we got new street lights, landscaping, uh, drainage improvements, new utilities. So uh, that was, a, that was a, a, a big accomplishment for this year. Um, the Holiday Inn Express uh, is ongoing. Uh, we are putting some funding into that uh, to help with some of their unusual infrastructure costs. They have some retaining walls in the back by the creek. The, uh, parts of it are in the floodplain. So basically what I said earlier about additional costs uh, that result in redevelopment projects, this is an example of that. Um, and the project was somewhat delayed. They ran into some site issues. Uh, there were some big boulders in the ground out there. Uh, they had supply chain issues like everybody else has with construction as a result of the pandemic. Um, so it's going to open in the spring of 2022 rather than, right, actually they anticipate opening right about now. Uh, so it's on track again, but it, it will be in 2022. Uh, streetscape enhancements. Uh, 
trees were planted. Uh, we, had, we included 25,000 in our budget this year to do trees. We didn't spend all that. Uh, several trees were planted around the Econa Lodge. Uh, as you know, it's a challenge. The, the right of way in along Manitou Avenue isn't very wide, and the roadway and the sidewalks and the other improvements basically have eaten up pretty much all the right of way to do work with. So we're trying to work with private landowners to try to include more trees and landscaping on their sites. So um, the Econo Lodge was very good to work with on, on, on several of those. Um, Leslie mentioned the pollination stations, um, and we worked again, Becca, there's a round of applause, by the way. Did a yeoman's job of getting those planters uh, from Denver and bringing them down here, and the URA helped pay for uh, all the plant materials that went in, into them. But they're all being maintained and taken care of by volunteers. Uh, so they're a great addition to the corridor, especially when the fact we, we just didn't have room to plant trees. So the planters were a big help. Uh, concentrated them around Beckers, so we had a, a, a bigger impact rather than try to spread, spread them out. And finally, the Pike's, Pike Ride Station was installed, uh, the one there, one at Triver Park. Um, and uh, it, was, it was installed and started in July. Uh, so we don't have a lot of statistics on how much it was used, but in July it was pretty high. And then it, it started to taper off in, in August and September as, as the, as the uh, tourism season wound down. So we hope to see better statistics next year because we'll have a whole, whole year of use. Okay, challenges that we faced. Um, again, we've been trying to attract redevelopment to the corridor, uh, and it's always a challenge. Um, land in, in Manitou is expensive, uh, so again, that's where tax increment financing will help. Uh, we do have several. We got, obviously, we had the Holiday Inn Express. Uh, that one has come to fruition, and we have a couple other ones in the pipeline. We're, excuse me. We're working with the owners of the old car wash site, which is Maggie's. Uh, they intend to build a new store on that side of the street and a much bigger store. Uh, we're working with them to help them, help them include more retail on the site besides just the one store uh, and also hopefully provide some public parking uh, that can be used uh, by the city as well. So we're working to that end. Uh, they're a little slow on their development right now. They haven't moved ahead, but uh, we're hoping to work with them more in 2022. Uh, and then Becker's Lane, uh, challenges there. Um, utilities were the biggest challenge. Uh, just coordinating and getting the, the utilities in there on time, not only just the public utilities, but the private utilities as well, Comcast and, and those folks to get the, everything coordinated. It slowed the project down a little bit, but in the end, it really came close to staying on schedule. So goals for 2022. Um, again, we're, we're, we've got a significant amount of money in our budget to actually do property acquisition. Uh, along Manitou and, and hopefully enter in development agreements with some of the property owners to get projects going. Um, we also have in there money for streetscape work. In 2021, uh, we funded the design, schematic design and budget estimates to do work on El Paso from Becker's to the city limits on the east end to try to do drainage improvements, pedestrian improvements. There's no sidewalk, curb and gutter. Uh, no landscaping, we'd like to add more trees in there, try to work with the school district, because uh, that's all along the ball field complex in there, uh, and maybe improve the parking as well. Uh, so we, we've got the uh, conceptual designs done and pro cost estimates in place. Uh, and so we're also working in 2022 to do the same thing for the Highway 24 intersection with Manitou Avenue to try to get Again, schematic design and fund you know, a cost estimate on what it will take to build. So between the two projects, we'll then hopefully come and and come show those to council and try to get a recommendation on which one, which way to go first on those. But both of those are are pretty critical projects for us. Uh, they're both safety improvements, pedestrian access, especially with Highway 24 is a real problem. Uh, so. Hopefully we'll have two projects to look at uh, in 2022. Um, where are we there? 
and yeah, Fountain Creek. So uh, one of the challenges we've had is to try to utilize Fountain Creek as an amenity through the project. We have the Creek Walk, which is great, but there's not a lot of great opportunities for public access to get to it. I mean, we have Adams Crossing and we have Becker's Lane. We'd like to get one more, and so we're gonna try to find a place maybe between Becker's Lane and Highway 24 to install a pedestrian bridge and can get a connection, possibly working with Maggie's to get an access to the creek through that area as well. And then finally, uh, we're gonna continue the programs we've got going right now with the street trees, uh, the added sculptures, uh, we're gonna wrap utility boxes, um, which is gonna be kind of fun. I don't know if you've seen them in Colorado Springs, but they've wrapped a lot of the utility boxes with uh, graphic arts and things like that. So we've got 12 large green ugly boxes and we wanna wrap those. And again, Be Becca is helping us with that. Uh, so hopefully we can get those to look like some really cool art pieces, if you will. Uh, and then, of course, we'll continue to work, finish with our banners. I noticed a lot of the banners need to be replaced, and so hopefully we'll address those in 2022. This is our budget. Um, the operating budget uh, is 295000 um, Give me just a little bit of detail on that. That includes things like salaries. We make a contribution to the shuttle. Uh, that goes up and down Manitou Avenue. Uh, grants, we, we do some facade grants and, and, and grants for private development. Uh, and then our, our typical cost, your legal fees, accounting fees, that type of thing are in, are in the operating budget. Uh, capital budget, again, this is all tax increment financing, uh, taxes that are generated by projects in the corridor, uh, no, no general fund dollars. And so this is, the total there is 3,237,000. Um, the two sculptures I mentioned, the Spirit of Manitou project, uh, Fields Park restroom, we're gonna contribute 65,000 to upgrading the restrooms, uh, adding, or actually adding a restroom building and doing ADA improvements. Uh, the city came to us and requested that and uh, we agreed those, those restrooms need a lot of work. Uh, so we're gonna put, we have a budget of 65,000 for that. Uh, property acquisition, as I mentioned before, uh, we've included 1.25 million for that. Uh, streetscape enhancements, 1.5, that'll include the design work, as well as hopefully get underway with one of the two projects. Um, and then we'll continue the street tree program. And then the Fountain Creek Bridge, as I mentioned earlier, we've allowed about $250,000 for that. Hopefully the bridge itself won't be that high, but we'd like to make some, add some amenities, whatever the access looks like, sidewalks, trees, landscaping, that type of thing to make it really attractive. Uh, and again, continue with the street light banners and brackets. And then finally, in 20, I'll clear this up a little bit. 2020. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's 2021, the budget is $30,000. In 2022, we've added 35,000 because we anticipate the cost will be going up. You're talking about the lighting? Yes, the street lighting for the Christmas. Christmas lighting. R holiday lighting, yes. You called it Christmas lighting, okay. I just, because you didn't say what it was for. Or yeah, we, we, wrap, we wrap all the light poles. So that would be $75,000 for Christmas lights, right? In How the whole city, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Jim, did, did you have more to, uh, for your presentation or are you ready to answer um, questions? You know the board? Oh, we don't have the board members up there? Oh, well, I know I gave it to you, but. Okay, well, I'll just make a quick mention about the board. We have nine members. Uh, the, the authority is an interesting hybrid government entity, if you will. It's actually created by the state of Colorado as an authority, standalone body. Uh, but the board members and all our plans are approved by city council. Uh, so it's kind of a, a hybrid, if you will. And as I mentioned, Farley is our board chair. And I mentioned it back there. Yeah. 
and Alan Gregory would be the, the vice chair. We don't have any openings. We have nine members. Uh, actually, we only have one member going off, and that would be you. <laughs> so Farley's up for renewal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been on it since 2006, so okay. maybe it's time. <laughs> no. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Council, do we have questions or comments here? Uh, Judith? Could you just clarify line item 35, the shuttle contribution of $150,000? Is that the 36 shuttle that you pay for? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that goes to, that's to Mountain Metro for that. And that's, that's just for the, what, four and a half months that it that run for five months? Because it runs from generally from like June 1st, basically. I think it's five, is it, Roy? It's five. Uh, April, April through end of September. Because it's not, is it April, the beginning of April? End of April, I yeah, believe. Yeah, because it's really June, so. Yeah. Okay. Or May, yeah. Oh, yeah, May. So it's really May 1. Until the end of, of September. September. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay. Julie? So, um, with respect to the acquisition of property, so, um, and you mentioned that all everything has to be approved by council. So you came to council previously and said, we'd like to have a, another hotel on the strip and, and, and we'd like to be able to buy this land and then sell it to Holiday Inn and now, can you explain how no, much the, the, the Holiday Inn really was not a project that URA pushed. Uh, it was a private development came through the city our redevelopment uh, development process. Uh, they, then they came to us afterwards and said, we need some help financially. So we looked at their numbers to make sure what they were asking for was basically their bottom line wasn't going to, wasn't penciling out, if you will. So we looked at it and determined how much tax increment they will be generating from the tax on the rooms. And so we'll be using that money that they generate to help them pay down some of their costs. Do we so do that, that had for, nothing to do with the acquisition project. Do we do that for all businesses? No, we only do it for redevelopment because basically the project has to generate the increment in order to have any money at all to work with. And has the URA already determined what type of additional businesses you want to be attracting with respect to this $1.25 million that you want? So, yes, we do have a a land use plan that was basically approved by council back in 2006, I don't know, 16, no. No, no, six, 16. 2016, there was a land use plan brought to council and was approved. And then we just updated the, recently in 2019 with the graphics. But the land use is pretty much what was approved back then. So can you just tell us, I'm not familiar with the 2016 document, can you tell us what kind of businesses are you trying to attract? A mixed use. Uh, so mostly, again, continue on with uh, hospitality, uh, with mo you know, the motel type thing. Also office, commercial, and residential, multifamily residential. Uh, ideally, we'd have retail on the ground level and possibly some apartments or uh, condos on the upper level. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? It appears there are none. So thank you very much. Appreciate it, Jim. Thank you all. Appreciate it, Farley. Thank you. Okay. Well, that concludes the uh, discussion on boards and commissions budget uh, presentations. The next item is Manitou Springs Arts Council and Creative District presentation. And I believe this is inf informational primarily. You're gonna tell us what, you, what you've been up to. May I recommend that council just open up the PowerPoint on their packet because we don't have it downloaded here. So if you open it on your packet, then you can look at the PowerPoint as they present. Okay. Hello, 
I'm Audrey Gray, president of the Manatee Springs Arts Council. Thanks for this opportunity. Can you speak closer? I'm sure. sorry. Thanks for this opportunity to keep you informed. Our purpose tonight is to provide updates to council about the upcoming merger of the Manitou Springs Arts Council and the Manitou Springs Creative District for your awareness. We know it's late, so we have a short presentation for you. Thank you. And I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Ralph Routen, who is our president of the Manitou Springs Creative District, but couldn't be here this evening. I'm also part of the merger team, and I am a board member on the Creative District. Um, we believe that these two organizations can do more for our community and the creative community together than they can apart. We think we can be more efficient with this merger and more effective together. We have complementary missions. We both serve artists and promote public art and a more livable community. Our mission together is to elevate and promote Manitou Springs creatives to lift artistic and economic vitality. We envision a thriving, vibrant arts and business community that moves us towards a more inclusive and creative future. Yep. Our merger process began with each board designating three merger committee members. The committee has invested more than 130 person hours over the past few months. We've analyzed the pros and cons of the merger, our financial situations, the city's public art inventory and our priorities and how they might mesh going forward. The name of the new group will be Creative Alliance Manitou Springs or CRANE for short. The name evokes our purpose, the elevating and lifting up of our community. It will adopt the 501c3 from the Arts Council and carry forward the shared commitment of each organization to support public art initiatives, the local creative community and its artists and makers. Rebecca Sickbert, whose title has been both Executive Director and Economic Recovery Director for the Creative District, will become Executive Director of the Creative Alliance starting on January 1st, 2022. Our merger process allowed us to create a new and complete inventory of all public art in Manitou Springs. For Farley, can you keep the mic? Oh, you sorry. About three inches from the mic. There please. we go. Oh, thank sorry, you. I'll start over. Our merger process allowed us to create a new and complete inventory of all public art in Manitou Springs. This was a huge feat, actually. And we give great thanks to Audrey Gray, Edie Green, and Mary Snyder, in particular for their help, as well as Pat Sitzman and the city staff for working with us on tracking these beloved community assets and landmarks. Both the Creative District and the Arts Council remain committed to our areas of ownership and focus in Plan Manitou, which recognizes that arts and culture are integral to the vitality, resilience, and long-term sustainability of Manitou Springs. We will continue to work closely with our community stakeholders and key partners, such as the City of Manitou Springs and the Manitou Springs Chamber of Commerce, as well as artists, creatives, nonprofit organizations, and our residents. These vital public-private partnerships help us engage creatives in how we improve and activate public spaces like parks, streets, and sidewalks. We plan on continuing working with our current partners to make Manitou Springs a three thriving creative community that is more livable for our residents. The merger team identified key programs that are core to our community. Our flagship programs like the Arts Council's signature Art on the Avenue installations will continue through the work of Crane's dedicated public art committee to keep our public spaces inviting and inspiring. We will also continue to operate as a state certified creative district, which as you likely know, took years of work to achieve and required significant commitments from the city, the Chamber of Commerce, and the community itself. 
Keeping our creative district designation ensures additional resources and access for community organizations and projects that we wouldn't otherwise have. Our next step is to continue working through our merger plan with legal enactment and financial transition in 2021. For reporting, our 2021 annual report to the community will reflect the operations of both organizations. And in 2022, we plan to develop a new MOU with the city of Manitou Springs to bring before council. And with that, we are open to any questions you might have. Council, again, I believe this is informational, but certainly it's a good time to ask questions or make comments. Julie? Do you get money from city budget? Yes. Well, so How much? Indirectly. Indirectly. <laughs> oh, okay. Can you explain that? Yes, the salary for Becca Sickbert is provided by the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, okay. And how much do they give you for her salary? Do you know that one? No, yeah, we budget 50... 55. 50,000. The Chamber budgets 50,000 to the Creative District. And again, can you speak into the microphone, please? The, I'm sorry. The Chamber of Commerce budgets the 50000 to the Creative District. Is that the only city money you get? In the past, the Manitou Springs Arts Council has received between two and $5,000 on different years for the Art on the Avenue program. Um, my understanding is that this might trans or move towards more of a match funding situation. And out of the 50,000 that you get from the um, chamber, how much of that, how is that money spent? That's On the director's That's salary. our executive director's oh, salary. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else from council? Yeah, Natalie. I guess I just wanna say this is really exciting and they've been meeting at the art center so I've seen a lot of the time and energy they put into this and I'm just looking forward to what comes next. I think that okay. the estimate that Becca gave us was 130 hours of volunteer time to create this merger. Great, thank you very much. I think that's it. I, guess, I suppose we'll see you sometime after the first of the year with the memorandum of understanding. Is that that's clear? Correct. Okay. Yeah, our um, hope is to um, come up with a new MOU. Our public art process is already outdated and not signed by both parties. And then we plan to mesh the two together into one new document. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. for Tim? No, I, I'd like to echo that this, you know, it, it sounds to be a really good um, uh, initiative that you guys are doing. And the one thing I would ask and I think you're undertaking this already, is the public art on the avenue process has always confused me <laughs> as to what the roles are of who and what and so on. So if you could lay that out really clear, I assume it will be in the MOU, but lay that out cl really clearly, I would be so appreciative. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I would echo that too. Yeah, the, the public art installation process could be clarified, I think, and made a little more efficient. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and item number three, a budget discussion. So council, among other things, we had submitted a number of questions to city staff to get feedback. I believe we're gonna address those tonight. And uh, then I, and also I'd, I'd like to get a, a sense uh, from you as to how much more time or deliberation, you know, you, 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 we wanna give to the budget. Uh, just a couple of things here. Uh, tentatively, we have, or we next week uh, for the uh, November 16th meeting, we have uh, scheduled the first reading of the budget, and then that would be followed in two weeks by the second reading. That would be December the 7th. Now, we're under a hard deadline of December the 15th to get the budget passed. That's a state law. So that essentially gives us the next two regular meetings. Uh, if we wanted to deviate from that schedule, we'd have to have at least one special meeting or a work, uh, uh, and potentially a workshop, you know, a work session, an evening meeting. So we can think about that. 
Let's go ahead and give uh, Becca an opportunity to respond to the questions that we gave her. Good evening. So actually, I always like to start out with the changes to the budget that have occurred since the last time it was presented. And there have been a, a few. So in the general fund under the planning department, HPC support had originally been budgeted at 103,500, but it's been reduced to 93,500 to reflect the actual request by the HPC that you saw earlier this evening. And this also reduced the HPC survey grant that was in the revenues for the general fund. And one other change was uh, the planning department requested a computer software funding for uh, their plan Manitou website hosting and survey, survey monkey. So that was increased to 3,750. So this leaves the unassigned fund balance for the general fund is forecasted for the end of 2022 to be uh, $4,028,554. Now, uh, there were some changes to uh, some other funds in addition to that change to the general fund. And that included um, open space expenditures. It had been increased from $275,005 to $429,205. And once again, this now matches what their request was earlier this evening. And that gives them an ending fund balance of uh, about 90,000. It's $90,016. And then uh, the Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority's funds, revenues and expenditures, which always match because the expenditures are then refunded by, from the Pikes Peak uh, Rural Transportation Authority because it's based on that sales tax that that we get, and uh, it was originally budgeted at 529,000, but based on the budget that was actually provided to the PPRTA, it's the revenue and the expenditures have been increased to a million two hundred seventy-four thousand and ninety-five dollars. So that fund balance remains the same. We have a dragging three thousand in there. Um, but normally it should, they always equal. So normally your fund balance at the end of the year is a zero. But right now we got this little dragging business. And then for the match fund, for 2021, the expenditures are increased to by 2000. And that was for that postcard mailer that Neil mentioned earlier. And then they, once again, they want a trainer to help applicants improve the quality of their applications. And for the 2022 expenditures, they're increased by, once again, what Neil had, has already shown you earlier today, was uh, $22,320, reducing the grants fund balance to 119,000 from 143,324. That's just the grants part. I, I'm not even talking about the, the match funds, uh, fund balance for the five, because that wasn't affected, so I'm only talking about changes. And finally, uh, the remaining fund amount of 142,150 in the downtown improvement fund is being budgeted for ADA improvements to the Wichita parking lot restrooms in 2022. Originally, I had no expenditures coming out of there uh, because um, I wasn't aware of, of this particular project. So could now that it has been put in there. Could you restate that amount, please? $142,150. That's the remaining fund balance in the Downtown Improvements Fund. And so that's all the changes. And I, I wasn't really planning to go through all the questions uh, because the questions and answers are actually in the memo. And uh, so that brings us actually to 
Um, my recommendation at this point for the budget and, and for city council. And at this point, I would say to, my recommendation is to approve the budget as is, and then in January, hold a retreat to discuss strategy, vision, and focus areas for the next two years, and know that the budget is gonna be reappropriated early next year that's assuming the mobility parking enterprise ordinance is approved. So this is gonna change things up quite a bit, but we, we can't address that until the ordinance is approved. And uh, since we're at the end of the year, that's gonna push us into the next year. But also always please know that city council has the ability to change the budget at any time. So you're not tied to just a mid-year and then the final. I mean. If, if you wanna change it at other times, you certainly have that prerogative. So at this point, Mr. Mayor, I would like to turn this discussion back over to you and see what is, uh, take the temperature of city council. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you, thanks for that recommendation. Yeah, and so council, I think that's what we need to do is decide uh, what our timetable looks like here. And, and uh, there are a number of fairly important factors here that council has expressed a, a pretty deep interest in. I think probably one of the, the most critical is the discussion of uh, the proposal to increase the marijuana tax. Um, that would be, presumably that would be a huge amount of revenue. Um, there may be some, some other certain considerations we'd like to, uh, to look at. I think that in and of itself does, would deserve a fairly thorough discussion I don't, uh, my, my personal thought would be I wouldn't want to hold up uh, getting the budget uh, passed uh, just because of uh, the discussion of marijuana. Again, as, as Rebecca said, if that were to pass and we saw a, a huge difference or you have huge ex hugely different expectations, I think we would come back and do some serious reconsideration of the budget. But that would be obviously at least several months into the future, into the new year. Um, We've I've had several people, several council members express their concerns about this. We're in an unusual situation in Manitou's life. We actually have some money in the bank. We could do some great things with it. Uh, last week, we got, you know, the, the, the federal um, government passed the Infrastructure Act, or you're getting started, um, in a discussion today with uh, uh, PPACG and PPRTA uh, representatives. Denise and I talked a little bit about uh, the future of what that's going to look like. It's going to be fairly complicated to sort this stuff out. So again, that would have potentially a huge and very favorable effect on, on the city's finances. That's going to change. So um, there's really a question, how much flexibility do we, want, do we want to give ourselves? Would we like to go ahead and get this uh, fairly stable budget nailed down and then uh, be committed to work on it again into the next year? So if we could kind of go around the the, the table here, I'll start with Mr. Shada. Uh, I agree with your thing. I think we ought to just get a stable budget in place. And then I think there's a lot of things that are on my mind that are just, we didn't have time to talk about in terms of the budget ramifications, service levels and things like that in terms of for the city that I think we'll have enough money to deal with. So I can hold my gun, I can hold my powder until January. Okay. Thank you. Natalie? I agree with John and I'm looking forward to January. Okay. <laughs> Judith? Uh, I agree and I also think that potentially the uh, results of the salary survey would be also very impactful. So would wanna add that into the discussion for our retreat in January. Good comments. Um, Steve? Well, I, I wish you all the best in, in January. <laughs> so good. Is that a gracious way to weasel out of something? <laughs> okay, thank you. Julie? Thank you. I agree with everything you said, Mayor, uh, with respect to unknowns with the future. However, We've spent, I think thus far, maybe 45 minutes talking about the budget for 2022. 
I consider that an inadequate amount of time to review such an important issue. Um, I was hoping and I was promised that tonight would be set aside to talk about the budget issue, but obviously it's 840 and we're just starting to talk about it, which it's way too late to get into it now. So um, I'm, not, I, I'm not happy about uh, approving the budget without, with just a 45 minute discussion that we had last time. Um, there are a number of things I wanna change. I don't think it's right to spend $75,000 on Christmas lights. Uh, for example, when we have so many other dire needs and looking at some of the responses that are in the memo to the questions, I find the responses, some of them unacceptable. Um, <laughs> we don't have money in the budget for a yellow stripe to save lives on Washington Avenue, but we're spending $75,000 on, on Christmas lights. I, I just, there's a lot of things I think that we could benefit from a discussion that we're not allowed to have um, based on uh, the agenda that has, has been shoved down our throats. And so I'm not happy about it. No, and, and let me respond to that. And, and I had mentioned that we could have additional meetings, you know, to, to go over this. Uh, admittedly, this is a, it's a big document. There's a lot of details. There's a lot of moving parts. I, I'd be in favor of an additional meeting, but if everybody else just wants to kick the can down the road, then maybe I'm just the lone voice on that. I don't know. Okay. Thank you then. Mayor Portem? Yeah, I think, I think the budget as it stands is at, you know, 95 to 99% there. So I'm very comfortable with um, having a retreat or something in the January timeframe to um, set more vision and, and high level policy guidance on uh, budget issues. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Councilor Chandler. Are, are we scheduled to have a meeting on the 30th? Was, is that already, because we had, we, we, so we won't be meeting the Tuesday of Thanksgiving and so we, we're then going to meet. Is is there is there reasonably well, time to? I mean, I think Councillor Wolf brings up some pretty important points. I, I'm willing to take a look at finding time. If, yeah. If yeah. No. Th th that that's a good point. Yeah. So tentatively, we do have uh, the 30th of November. That's the fifth Tuesday. We'd originally normally we wouldn't have a meeting then, but because of. Uh, First, because of the the joint sessions we were having with the planning commission, we decided we would do that. Then, of course, we decided to let let a special committee take over that job. So that kind of left that night available, and we tentatively entertained the idea of of having that for a marijuana discussion. Uh, I think that's probably something that we could see pushing down the road judiciously. But then use use that night if you want to to to, to talk budget. Uh, the the budget could be amended. I mean, if we made changes between the first reading, we want to make changes, we could do that on the, the night of the second reading and still get that December 7th deadline. So Julie, kind of to speak to your point that we could have an, an entire night dedicated to the budget discussion if you well, want. I mean, I, if there was council support for that. I, I appreciate that. I don't want to kick the can down the road for the marijuana tax. I think that's too lucrative to kick down the road. And I see no reason why we can't have both issues address the same night as long as we don't have all other junk put in. <laughs> um, I, I'd be in favor of that. I'd appreciate that very much. Okay, so, um, well, let's get, let's get a sense from council as to uh, what kind of support there is for that. So this would mean having a meeting. Well, let me, let me first ask, would Becca, because it's kind of on you to, to come up with some of the information on the, the marijuana uh, proposal, would you have, would, November the 30th be realistic to get a, enough detail, do you think? Yes, currently working on it. Okay, so, so that's, that's in the realm of doable, it sounds like. Okay, so the thought is, do we wanna take the 30th of November and, spend, and use that to discuss the marijuana uh, tax and also to flesh out uh, any remaining things on this part of the budget, probably with the idea that we'd, we'd have another closer look after the first of the year. Denise, your comment? A um, couple of quick things, and uh, Councillor Chandler mentioned this, is the compensation study will not be done by that time, so just so. Also, the other thing is the, um, the election 
of the other marijuana store will not be completed until the uh, middle of January. So those, and then the other thing that you mentioned, there were three things that we were waiting on, and I can't remember the third one. Was it the Oh, the enterprise the and what that looked like. So we mm -hmm. did that. And then I also do want to say, um, Councillor Wolf, the statement reads, staff needs clarification on the exact location and point of contact to discuss the residential needs for Washington Avenue. It does not state we do not have the money. We just need additional information so with that we can follow up and see exactly what we need to do there per your request. Oh, thank you. You're right. I, I made a mistake. I was looking at number two, the, the sidewalk at the corner of Ruxton. But um, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And there's no money in the budget for a phone number. You know, I actually called 911 over the weekend because there were those electric um, uh, bikes uh, on on the uh, Adams Bridge or Adams Crossing Bridge or whatever it's called uh, on the sidewalk so that anyone in a wheelchair couldn't possibly pass and it would be way too hazardous to try to, I think, squeeze in with traffic in your wheelchair. Um, and of course they said, no, you have to call that other phone number. So then I called that other phone number and it took forever and I finally got a voicemail and of course nobody ever got, got back to me. So I, I finally just drove over to the police station and explained that there's a problem there that, you know, uh, I'm just saying, I, I just think some of these things are important and I would appreciate a chance to talk about it. So if we can have support for the November 30th time to um, spend on some fine tuning some of this, that'd be great. Okay, let's go around the table and, and, and see. Mr. Shada? I guess I don't have a problem discussing the 4% that we're not collecting this year. I think that might inform us about what we want to do in January. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, come back to me. I'm sorry? I'm still, I, I, um, well, I'll come back to you. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't understand at first there. The mask doesn't help. Okay. Uh, Judith. I, I'm certainly willing to meet on the 30th. I, I want to, I want to get this right. And I, I, I agree with mayor pro tem we're, we're, we're close, but I mean, if there are issues, this is one of the most important things we do, um, for, for, for the city all year. So I, I'm uh, happy to show up on the 30th. Okay. Thank you. And, and I would certainly be willing to show up on the 30th. I, I do think probably there's some low hanging fruit that it wouldn't take a whole lot of tweaking to the existing budget. We could, you know, put some paint down on the street here and there, you know, and, and get that knocked out. And that anything we can do in November is something we don't have to address in January. Mayor, Mayor Pertem. Again, I'm, you know, very um, comfortable with the budget as it is. I don't have a need to, uh, I, I would rather discuss it in a, in a uh, retreat um, environment. Um, than cherry picking what we discuss on the 30th. So I'm, I'm good to go. I'll be here on the 30th. I'll be in town on the 30th. So, you know, obviously I'll show up if it's called, but I don't have a need for it. Okay, thank you. Julie, we know how you stand. Steve? I'm with Nancy. Um, I'm good with the budget. I'll be here the 30th and I'll be here need be otherwise I would uh, prefer not to yeah I think the general I'm sorry Natalie well I'm, I'm also available on the 30th okay well I, I think uh, you know I, I think that's a good sign of teamwork um, I think we can be here on the 30th and we can go over it and um, maybe we'll make a do a little bit of tweaking um, but I think that would be uh, a good choice. Thank okay. you. So let's let's plan on the thirtieth. We'll uh, we'll discuss. We'll, we'll limit it to two items, and unless some act of God <laughs> interferes, uh, we'll uh, go over the the marijuana a little bit, and uh, and then also uh, take a, a a final look at this version of the budget with the idea that we'll address it again in uh, January. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly. That brings us to um, Receiver Act on Council Correspondence. Anybody have anything? 
It's been a quiet week here and also in Lake Wobegon. All right, let's go to the city administrator's report. Um, just to let council know that the, the hydro pump is up and running um, today. So we have some power being generated and it'll be checked the rest of the week and following weeks and tweaked as needed. Um, the other thing I talking to Mountain Metro today, they are um, looking at getting a grant to provide a electric shuttle for Manitou, specifically for Manitou. Um, keep in mind that these shuttles take about a year to produce. So, um, you know, it would be for 2023 um, and we would just have to be able to provide the way to power it um, through the trip through Manitou. So we're working on that with the EV charging stations already on how we're gonna do that. And finally, uh, the, the Hiawatha landscaping there, they're gonna be at least pulling out the weeds and things that need to come out around Hiawatha before the end of the year. Um, and then the rest of the landscaping will be done next year. Um, they're keeping it there now for the deer uh, migration um, since there's a lot of uh, uh, vegetation that deer need during this time. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Just two quick things. Um, we are closed on Thursday for Veterans Day, so we will be closed on that day. And Friday evening is the fire department SOP. We've sent it out, posted it, did everything that we could, sent emails out to individuals that attended. So that has um, that is Friday evening here at City Hall. And is, is that six to eight o'clock? Believe it's six to seven thirty. I'm sorry, I should have it that memorized and I don't, so I can make sure and send it out. You guys have been, I think, notified, but I will make sure you have uh, it. And now that you mentioned, I think 7.30 is correct. Is there a reason they plan that for a Friday night? It's 6 p.m., I think, to 7.30. Um, on Julie, a Friday I don't night. know, but that's what they scheduled the first time was a, f a Friday night. And then um, I know we've notified everybody that we could, like I said, through the emails and other things. And um, that was the date that they set it. So I can't answer that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Friday night seems like a little, a little tricky. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then we'll be bringing that back to, to um, council, but we'll be putting all the uh, everybody who attended, any notes, anybody that wants to meet with them individually, I know we'll meet with them also and do those things too. So if you know of somebody that can't attend and would like to meet, um, and we might even offer another day, I just know that's the initial day at this point. But if you hear of somebody that would like to meet and can't attend, let us know and I know we'll meet with them one-on-one -on -one too. Okay, great, thanks. Well, I think we've covered everything, so we stand adjourned. <laughs>